Hello, this next video will conclude Art 101 and discuss the late Gothic style in France and then move on to regional Gothic styles in both Germany and in Italy and think about the late medieval period in Italy as we transition in towards the Renaissance and think about things like the plague and how that would have affected art production and things like that. So starting off with the late Gothic style in France, we're in the Rayonnon or Radiant Court style or Radiant Gothic period, which runs roughly from 1240 to 13. 1850, and this is a period where we tend to see a flourishing of the Gothic style in the courts, uh, meaning the royal court, with a lot of very elegant works of art. So starting off, let's look at a manuscript page commissioned by Blanche of Castile for her son, Louis IX, who became king very, very young. We see him here looking quite youthful. Uh, we see Blanche here looking very wise, lecturing him, gesturing towards him, uh, and you see some very typical Gothic trefoil arches just above, very graceful columns, and then down below you see uh, men of the church, monks in what looks like a scriptorium, so men working away with one man seemingly lecturing on one side and one man receiving the instructions on the other side. Um, so clearly you have this set up between the queen regent up above who's instructing her new, uh, the new king, Louis IX, and then also you have this instruction going on down below, referring to the fact this is a manuscript that would have been produced in one of the finest scriptoria of the time. Um, it's coated in gold leaf, it's done on vellum, it has tempered paint done very very nicely um, with very expensive looking pigments like the blues, the rich blues that we see here. Clearly these are individuals of high status with their crowns, Louis holding onto his scepter, uh, and they're wearing very fine royal robes and garments. So clearly a high status object, and this is basically the cover page or the kind of title page of a moralized Bible that would have been given from his, uh, his mother Blanche of Castile to Louis IX, um, presumably soon after he came to the throne. Uh, Louis's probably most famous contribution, architectural contribution, is Saint Chapelle, which is in Paris. Uh, it was a very expensive project, really functioning as a grand reliquary containing some of the most important relics that were purchased by Louis and brought to Paris, making Paris like a new holy land, um, bringing things like the crown of thorns into Paris. And he had spent an amazing amount of money collecting some of these relics from rulers in different areas, primarily from the east and areas of Byzantium. Uh, and so he was able to collect relics like the crown of thorns, a bit of the true cross, uh, things like the, the nails of Christ. Uh, so these were very important relics that were now being brought into Paris and contained within this Palatine chapel, this chapel that would have been connected to the royal palace or connected to the royal area where Louis would have lived. Um, Louis became a saint soon after he died, so he was known to be a particularly pious and holy ruler uh, and died while he was on a crusade. So he was known to have uh, fought for Christianity, which added to his... Uh, legend and added to the fact that he became such an important ruler later on. Um, but just looking at the structure itself, you can see that the walls really have been melted away and, and all we really have here are these bundles of columns and small bundles of columns and then huge areas of stained glass, so allowing the entire walls or most, most of the walls to really be covered by this stained glass that's covering the walls here. So really tall lancet windows um, and then lots of decoration and gothic tracery. Uh, so just noting kind of some of the things that Louis the Ninth did acquire, so the crown of thorns, part of the true cross, the iron lamp, the sponge, and a nail, objects of Christ's passion, so all part of his uh, crucifixion uh, from the Latin emperor of Constantinople who was looking to get more funds, and so Louis was able to pay him quite a bit for these objects. And so looking in at the interior on kind of a detail of some of these stained glass windows, you can see those tall lancet windows, those kind of tall pointed windows, and then you've got um, trefoil decoration here, quatrefoil decoration, so just kind of those three-lobed versus four-lobed structures or um, areas with the stained within the stained glass. And moving on, um, moving into the late Gothic flamboyant period where we tend to see even more ornate decoration. You tend to see often a flame-like decoration in the Gothic windows. Um, but I, what I want to focus on is a manuscript by Jean Poussel, who was a very famous manuscript um, illuminator. You can see this is done primarily in grisaille, which is noted here. So grisaille is a gray technique. You use a lot of gray techniques to give this illusion of sculpture, almost making it look like stone. 
So what you see in this manuscript, which is very, very small, a small portable manuscript that was uh, owned by a French queen, Jean de Vreux, whose name is listed down here. Um, it's from the early 14th century. And what you see in this manuscript are these pairings on some of the pages between Christ's passion, so the period before his crucifixion, and then Christ's early life, or the, the life of the Virgin. And so what you have here is the betrayal of Christ, where Judas is identifying him through a kiss. Christ is easily identifiable with his halo. And then on the opposing side, you have this moment of the Annunciation, where the angel Gabriel is coming to the Virgin to announce to her that she's pregnant. Um, and their bodies have this really dramatic, what we call the Gothic S-curve, this kind of sweeping of their bodies, this sloping of their bodies, um, where the bodies don't have that solid contrapposto stance, which we saw in the classical period. It's more of this graceful sway to the body with a gentle sway of the drapery as well. So we see that in both cases, and what's nice is their bodies kind of lean in towards one another, so the pages really respond to each other. Uh, so you see a figure praying here, maybe this is supposed to be the queen. You also see courtly activities and games, things like jousting and tag. Um, but the quality of the illumination really is exceptional, especially because this is such a tiny book. It's just a couple inches, three and a half by two and three and a half by two and a half. Um, so really, really small. So a prayer book, a book of hours, which would have given the queen different prayers to pray throughout the day. So that was the whole idea of a book of hours, giving you prayers throughout the day, um, but also something that would have been pleasurable for someone who was interested in courtly art. All right, moving on to the Gothic style in Germany, we tend to see a bit more um, gruesome figures, and figures that really are supposed to um, increase devotion and increase contemplation among the viewers. So this is the Rodgen Pieta. The Pieta was a common theme in Northern Europe, Northwestern Europe, uh, where you have the Virgin holding on to the body of her dead son following the crucifixion. This is not a story that's recounted in the Gospels, but it's something that um, becomes very popular in this area of Northern Europe. And so what we see here is a particularly gruesome version where Christ's wounds are really emphasized. We see um, the five wounds, one, two, three, four, five. There's a wound in his side here. Um, we also see kind of the suffering of Christ through his um, the fact that he's very, he looks emaciated, like he just looks so, so thin. You can see his ribs along the side of his body. You can see the ribs there. Um, and also you see the devastation of the virgin, kind of her expression and her emotion. And these are often refers to, referred to as andachsbilder, or that's the plural, so andachsbild would be a singular. Um, and these are just these devotional images that are often filled with emotion, um, often have scenes that emphasize the suffering of Christ to increase the devotion and the prayers and the sadness of the followers when they think about this idea of Christ, um, his kind of offering and his sacrifice. And another type of image that was popular were these crucified Christ that also emphasized Christ as very thin, looking emaciated, um, emphasizing his suffering on the cross. And often these were called pest cruces or um, works that were commissioned during times of plague or during times of disease. And so hopefully in both examples you can see this clear emphasis on suffering um, and the idea of sacrifice. So both these types of images were very popular in Northern Europe around this time. And what we'll see is images like the Pieta will become refined and um, more kind of visually pleasing as we move towards the Renaissance in Art 102. Um, so we do have the arrival of the Black Death in 1348. You have a famine in the early 14th century, which probably affected people, lowering people's immune systems. Plagues are going to spread more easily. Um, if people aren't well nourished, it first arrives in Sicily and then begins to spread around Europe. The exact number of people who died, really, it's difficult to um, exactly put a finger on it uh, or to identify because the censuses weren't as clear as they are now. Um, but somewhere between 30 and then 30 percent and then up to some... Some people say up to 60% of people died in different areas. Uh, there was a bacteria probably transmitted by fleas, and it was extremely contagious, and it affected people very quickly, which was why it was so shocking. So let's just keep this in mind as we continue to look at art from the 14th century. 
So we're moving into Italy and looking at examples of the Gothic style there. Um, so by the 14th century, so when this church was started in 1386, this Cathedral of Milan, which was going to be a very, very large church, one of the largest in all of Christendom. Um, when it was first begun, the Gothic style was fashionable. They brought in architects from France to help to help guide it. Um, even though they were taking on more of a northern style in this northern Italian city, um, at the time it still would have been pretty fashionable. But this took over 600 years to complete and so by the time of course it was completed or by uh, the period of the Renaissance really this style was very out of fashion but uh, they continued to use things like the pinnacles, they used some of the buttressing on the outside, uh, it's a little bit less of a vertical emphasis than what we tend to see in France. Um, and also you start to see some of those Renaissance classical elements starting to be introduced in the pediments over portals and over windows. So up here you see more of a traditional Gothic window and then more of a Renaissance style portal and window down below. So really this is a hybrid structure that's indicating um, primarily Gothic style but also demonstrating that there is this transition to a Renaissance style later on. Um, just showing you some of those portals and some of those comparisons between windows. Um, we also see the Gothic style in Venice. Venice, of course, was a major trading center. And so in the Doge's palace, the Doge was the figurehead of Venice. We see Gothic tracery along this upper balcony. Uh, we see more classical elements and certain elements of the columns. We see pointed arches, which are more Gothic. And then up above, you see this really refined tile work and really interesting crenellations up here, which seem to come more from Islamic territories or Islamic lands. So this palace, which would have been the area where all travelers or where most travelers would have arrived, especially those who were having um, a special diplomatic visit, they would have entered in this main um, piazza of San Marco and they would have seen the structure and the structure would have exemplified a number of different influences that exemplified that Venice really was a trading center and an international city. Um, another international Gothic work or demonstration of this Gothic style in Italy um, is this scene of the Annunciation where we see the angel Gabriel announcing to the Virgin that she will be pregnant. You see the Holy Spirit indicated here. Um, very Gothic style frame. This is actually a later frame, however, that was added in the Gothic style. Uh, but the bodies themselves are very traditionally Gothic. So you have that elegant curve of the body. The bodies are very thin. Um, so this style would have greatly been appreciated during the Gothic period. Some of that flamboyant Gothic style that we saw, for example, in those hours of Jean Devereux. We see some similarities here. So at this point, the Gothic style is known as stylish and important, and it's spreading throughout Europe. And this would have been commissioned as a very expensive altarpiece um, in one altar, one area of one chapel of the Siena Cathedral. We also, have our, however, see the Byzantine style in Italy. So an artist named Cimabue, who was seen as bringing in new Renaissance naturalism. So we see some dimension to the throne. We see some a modeling to the forms here. Um, but we also see Byzantine elements of having more of an icon style here. So the Virgin functioning as a throne. She still has some kind of flattened elements to her. You see a lot of gold used here in a very Byzantine style. Um, so Italy really is a melting area or a melting pot of different styles at this point. So you've got that international Gothic style, you still have some Byzantine elements coming in, and then you see a renewed interest in some in some classical antiquity and some naturalism. So artists like Chumabue are seen as transitional artists moving into that Renaissance style. Uh, and our final work is to look at the Palazzo Publico, the main city hall in Siena, uh, which is this city in Tuscany. And if we go inside, we get a sense of the fact that uh, more people are starting to participate in government. And so we think about participatory governments, more democratic forms of government, where lots of people are coming together. Um, although it was mostly men, it was a restricted group of citizens, you are seeing more of a rule by many rather than a rule by one at this point in Italy. So, um, for example, if you go into the Sala dei Nove, which was the room of the nine individuals who really made most of the decisions in Siena, you see these frescoes of good and bad government. And what you see are a number of allegorical figures on one wall that indicate good government, um, and you also see the results of good government. So if we look at the effects of good government, you see a city thriving with construction, trade, uh, people getting married, signs of harmony. If we go to the countryside, you see that crops are thriving, you see that people um, have enough to eat, and there's an allegorical figure of security up here. 
And then on the opposing side, you see the results of bad government. So you see a very fragmented wall um, with figures fighting, and you see the city falling apart. So it's very easy to spot that uh, you have the results of good government on one side, bad government on another side. So those illustrations are very clearly supposed to guide those who are ruling at this point. And so this is a nice transition as we move towards Art 102, which will cover more of the Renaissance period and these participatory forms of government.